course then when you start to kind of expand out and think about the, the value of these things for, for, um, for wildlife, um, it, it, they tick a lot of boxes, I suppose, really, is what, <laughs> quite, quite obviously. Um, you know, there's been a huge um, crash in a lot of our insect population and invertebrates. And, um, you know, there's, there's big concerns about um, pollination and, and pollinators. And if you look in other parts of the world where um, people are moving bees from one continent to another because there aren't enough pollinators to, to do the jobs, um, you know, the wildflower meadows um, and, and wildflower grasslands obviously support a huge amount of pollinators. And of course, because we've lost those in the countryside, it's obviously had a major impact on our on our pollen but of course they do you know they do support those things so you know another aspect of, of grassland um and you know the same again with the nectar so and i suspect i i had a very very small um garden in my previous house it was probably about two meters by one meter um, and about 10 years ago, we put it over to, we, we stripped the, the turf, which had been laid. It was, it was a modern housing estate. And they, of course, they just, they just stuck some, you know, regular garden turf. We stripped the turf off. Um, I managed to get hold of a packet of wildflower seed and we just spread the wildflower seed. And within two years, we had, you know, some wildflowers. And it was literally surrounded by concrete in a cul-de-sac. But I mean, I it just, I think it's just always amazing to watch these things at close quarters and see the things that come into these places and, and how insects, wildlife and birds find these, these, these little areas, you know, and of course we left ours right through normally till the end of September before we cut it. So of course a lot of those flowers would then flower, they would seed and lots and lots of birds would come and eat those seeds. So, it, you know, another fascinating aspect of wildflower meadows. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is that, you know, these areas of wildflowers, whether this be in a garden or, or in the sort of wider countryside, you know, have a huge amount of value and are very important for wildlife. Um, I'm just trying to sort of summarise on this slide some of the, the benefits there. Um, and if you think about the sort of wider benefits to society as well that are kind of being looked at now in terms of um, cultural value um, and I know I expect we can talk about Lammas Meadows at some point but um, and there's lots of other cultural and archaeological um, sort of le links back to these things um, and this idea of, of um, what services some of these habitats can play you know benefit us as well becoming quite an important aspect of, of what's going on in the country when we're trying to support um, meadow management and meadow creation so meadows definitely store carbon um, they help to filter water, they help to stop flooding. So, you know, they start to, they start to deliver quite a lot of benefits. And what the awful word is ecosystem service. I'm sure people have heard that before, but that, that's the kind of techie, that's the sort of policy word that gets used. But ultimately, the, the, there's a lot of things that meadows do for us, basically. So if you think about what makes a meadow, um, the slide here really is just trying to sort of summarise some of the things um, that ultimately mean a meadow will be be on a certain place. I suppose it it, it will um, what's the word persist. It will survive there, um, and it's kind of this interaction, I guess, between all of these different things here. Um, soil is is a big thing, and obviously that has a big bearing on the kinds of plants that will grow anywhere. Um, I'm sure everyone who's a gardener was very much aware of, of how much, you know, the importance of the different types of soil and of course soil varies up and down the country. Um, the quality of that soil, um, how much nutrients are in that soil, um, the pH of that soil again has a bearing on the plants. Um, the other thing that is very important about meadows is the way they're managed as well. So, and again, we'll come on to this in a bit more detail. And again, if you think about this in, in a garden context, um, management has a, has a bearing on whether plants or flowers will persist um, and whether you will get more or less flowers as well. So, so, so the management um, is, a, is a real key thing to meadows. Um, but again, soil is very important and the soil nutrients are very important and how, you know, the soil itself obviously is fundamental to it. And of course, it's all these other things overlay. So, you know, once you, once you, you know your soil um, and you've got the plants in there, the other things will come of their own accord. So, um, I don't know, I mean, Pete, the Chilterns is, is variable, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's a fair old lump of chalk in the Chilterns. Um, so obviously the soil there um, is uh, lime rich um, 
So that has quite a big bearing on the types of plants that you'll get um, on chalky soil. And I suspect quite a lot of people's gardens. Um, Katie, maybe you'll come in here and just talk yep. a little bit about the soil of the Chilterns. Yeah, well, um, um, Nick's probably more familiar with, with it than me, but lots of people are on chalk, but there are actually quite a lot of um, areas of clay or neutral grasslands as well. So um, mm. I, I know there are some people, in fact, probably some people who are here today who have left their lawns and, and in the Chilterns, you can be really lucky and have things like orchids come up um, in your garden if you just leave it to grow, which is which is actually half the fun of leaving it, I think, because you never quite know what's going to crop up. Uh, but if you're on more neutral soils or the clays, then then you get a different mix of plants that, that will show up there. But I'm, I'm sure people here um, have some examples of that themselves from home. So we, I think we're looking here at a fairly typical sort of example of a piece of chalk grassland. Um, you know, and chalk grassland arguably is probably, you know, um, can be one of the, the, the um, most species rich um, if it's managed in the right way and has, has been managed for a long time, you can get up to sort of potentially up to 40 species per square meter on a piece of chalk grassland, which is, which is pretty, pretty amazing, really. Um, and I suppose some of the special plants that you might find on chalk grassland, um, and again, I haven't got any images of these, but um, thyme is quite a common one. And if you walk through a piece of chalk grassland, you often you'll get that aroma and you'll smell it. Um, wild marjoram as well is quite another one, which obviously these, these herbs that give you that scent. Um, and things like quaking grass as well. So these, these are quite characteristic of chalk grassland, as well as bird's foot trefoil. Um, and I think here we've got greater knapweed, I think. If that's if mm. anyone wants to confirm, that looks like greater knapweed to me. Yeah. Um, and there might be, I don't think, I can't see any scabious in there. But again, so there are certain plants that are characteristic of chalk soils. Um, and then there are other plants that are more characteristic of these neutral kind of maybe clay soils, which kind of are more neutral. So. Um, so this one here is an example of a more sort of neutral, um, what we would call a neutral, I suppose, lowland meadow. Um, you can see red clover there in the front, um, and you can also see quite a lot of yellow, um, mostly buttercup. Um, you can see bird's foot trefoil down there in the bottom right hand corner, um, and you can also see quite a lot of yellow rattle in there as well. Um, probably some sorrel somewhere in the back there as well, and various other grasses that we can't really can't really work out um, and in the front there probably ribwort plantain I suspect um, but again you know there's, there's so so depending on the soil type you, you will get a different plant community so you'll get plant communities that do very well on the chalky soils and then you'll get a different a subtly different plant community that will do better on these kind of clay and more neutral soils so so the ph of your soil really does have a, a quite a bearing on the, on the types of plants that will will do better there um, and like we said I'm, I'm sure people have got a range of different soil types in their gardens some people are more on chalk and some people are most likely more on sort of the more neutral slightly clay or or more loam soils so and of course that might have a bearing on the types of plants you might find growing in a lawn in your garden so I just really wanted to talk a little bit about why, why some of the, you know, why we've lost 97% of our meadows over the last sort of 70 or 80 years. Um, and for some people, this may be obvious, but um, probably one of the biggest reasons really is, is changing farming practices. Um, and if you sort of take, you know, turn the clock back sort of 70 or 80 years um, and think about how farming was at that time, it was much, much less mechanical. Um, they weren't using big machines, uh, they weren't using chemicals, uh, they weren't using artificial fertilisers, um, and, and it was a more of a traditional management practice. And really, most of these very species-rich meadows came about through those very traditional management practices, this regular, regular management year after year after year of managing meadows in particular ways. Um, and as agricultural technology changed, and this is sort of probably particularly during and after the, the, the sort of two wars at the beginning of the last century, um, people started to improve land, they started to drain land, they started to use artificial fertilisers, um, they started to reseed things and things got ploughed up. So ultimately we start to lose a lot of these meadows. And, and then as, uh, alongside that we start to get change in farming practice. So um, the photograph there is of silaging. Now silaging is generally done in May and early June. There's a lot of silaging going on right now and I suspect in your neck of the woods there's probably silaging going on. Um, most wildflowers tend to flower in sort of, well, June, July and some in August. 
And so if you cut your meadow or your grass in your lawn early, um, say now, you're obviously cutting a lot of those flowers before they get a chance A to flower and then to set seed. Um, so that, that, that big change in farming practice obviously has had a huge bearing on meadows just disappearing in the countryside. Um, so so th that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is this changing of uh, what's growing in meadows. So old meadows being ploughed um, and then reseeded. And as, con you know, as, as productivity and, or as farmers were being encouraged to grow more crops, and this particularly kind of pertains to after the Second World War, um, and lots of research going into what, how can we get as much out of these pieces of land as possible. Um, they started looking at what types of varieties of grass they could plant and ultimately they decided that you could, you could plant very few numbers of grasses and a couple of um, flowers. So we're looking there at rye grass and we're looking at white clover. Um, and those are very typical of um, very, what we would call intensively managed grass and so agriculturally improved. So, so the grass, the very green, lush, grassy fields that you often see um, up and down the country, which have got normally one or two species in, but historically may well have had a lot more species in them. But of course they were changed agriculturally. And of course that's again, another reason for the loss of all these meadows. And again, you know, I, I sort of mentioned that in the fact that people are putting huge amounts of artificial fertilizer on which grass responds very well to and this is something we'll come back to when we talk about gardens that of course um, it's almost counterintuitive that if you grow lots of grass you don't really have very much space for wildflowers the grass just out competes all the wildflowers so fertilizer helps grass grow but doesn't help wildflowers grow um, and of course farmers then started to spray because they would consider quite a lot of the wildflowers that we would now value as, as weeds so they would put selective um, herbicides onto fields and then that, that would kill a lot of the, the wildflowers basically. Um, so those are some of the reasons why um, we lost a lot of these, these meadows up and down the country over the last sort of 60 or 70 years. Um, if you sort of think and look at that more in a sort of garden context and you think about okay um, I've got a lawn in my garden for example um, and what might be in that lawn if you start to leave it. Um, there's, there's two things here really. I mean one thing is that there's lots of new housing going in uh, lots of new houses that they tend to just screw you know, they, they, there's a building site around that property and of course they make a real mess they scratch they they, they rip up everything um, and and um, then they they come in and they, they throw it over topsoil down and then they roll out these lovely bits of very bright green turf which is very similar to what you might see you know in these agriculturally improved fields it's it's just grass and it's designed to be hard wearing so the kids can play on it and they can kick a football about but it doesn't tend to have very few it doesn't tend to have very many other plant species in it um, and then if you go and look in other places where there are maybe older buildings and older houses so this is a churchyard and if you think about why churchyards have lots and lots of wild and you know often churchyards have lots of wild flowers in it um, I guess there's a few things here one thing is that that building has been there a long time the churches you know some of them are sort of thousand plus years old and often the, the ground around it probably at some point was agricultural land and it just became enclosed around that church it wasn't like they came in and they bulldozed the, how, the land and then they basically rolled out loads of green turf. So you end up with these kind of fragments of, of what we now would consider really valuable species rich grassland. And the same often applies in a, in a house context where you're looking at older houses where, you know, they didn't lay loads of turf down. Often old houses were built out of fields, you know, it was like, okay, there was some fields and we stick some houses in. And of course, often what you find is that you've still got remnants of, of that piece of quite nice species, rich grassland um, in your garden. And I suspect quite a lot of people have got that in a garden, particularly even not very older houses will, you know, still end up with the survival of actually quite nice bits of more species rich turf in their gardens. Um, so if, you're, if your garden hasn't been turfed, um, in the very recent past, the likelihood is it probably has got quite a lot of wildflower species in it, but they're just being cut and cut and cut. You may not necessarily be aware of what's actually in there. I'm going to sort of focus in now a little bit on, on gardens and lawns. Um, so, so, you know, the, the left hand example there, I guess, is a, is a lawn that, that's probably an old lawn that probably hasn't been um, either reseeded or hasn't been, you know, someone hasn't gone to the garden centre and bought some of that lovely green turf that makes it all look shiny and stripy and, 
and lovely. Um, you know, most of those turfs that you might buy at a garden centre obviously, you know, have got grass in them and they don't tend to have any other wildflowers in them. And whereas if you've got a lawn around an older property, you know, not necessarily around an older property, but a lawn that hasn't been reseeded or returfed, the likelihood is it's probably going to have more species in it um, than the one on the right hand side there, really. So, so I suppose that's where the opportunity is really here. And this is really what we're trying to talk about and what we're trying to encourage people to do is just to kind of leave their lawns um, and see what grows and you'll be surprised I think most people are really surprised that, as to what will appear in the lawn um, that's you know most people we're just used to cutting it and cutting it and cutting it all the time and of course um, you're just constantly cutting off any of the potential flowering plants that, that might be in there and there are quite a lot of plants and particularly these low growing plants so the examples there on the, on the right hand side um, white clover there at the front um you've got bird's foot trefoil as well which is the um, yellow one I'm sure ah, can i sorry can one. i just jump in yeah there? but any, anyway so yeah just going back to those um so so you can kind of see the difference there between those two um so yeah i mean i suppose just thinking about you know why 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 potentially are lawns so good for this really um, uh, you know one thing is that idea that quite a lot of lawns are quite old and they haven't necessarily been fiddled around with you know unless it's a, it's a very new property and they may have been you know reseeded or, or, or laid with turf um, and also a lot of people tend to just cut their lawns and they collect all the cuttings too um, and ultimately over time and of course if that lawn has been managed in that way for a very very long time Often what you find is the grass is not that lush anyway. And of course that means you've actually got quite low nutrients um, and actually wildflowers. And this is, this is this, this kind of funny thing. And of course, most gardeners would think that you need to, to, you need to have good nutrients for plants to grow. I think that's what, you know, we, we all kind of think that, don't we sort of, that's a logical thing that plants need nutrients. Of course, plants do need nutrients. Uh, but in this context, when you're talking about grass with wildflowers, it's the grass that grows and out competes the wildflowers when you add nutrients. So, so in most circumstances, when we're trying to manage for wildflowers, we're trying to start or trying to decrease nutrients as much as we can so that the grass doesn't out compete and smother the wildflowers. So of course lawns, because of the way they've historically been managed, often are very low in nutrients because that constant every couple of weeks cutting and collecting cutting and collecting which ultimately starts to reduce nutrients not always but quite often so often you've got lots and lots of wildflowers just waiting for somebody to stop cutting it um, and they will just amazingly spring to life so if you think about gardens there are, there are, i suppose there are two possible ways of managing an, a lawn for, to, to encourage more wildflowers um, and they both have, I suppose, different benefits, really. Um, the traditional way of sort of thinking about how you manage an area for wildflowers, and if this is really relating back to how we might manage in the wider countryside, is, is you think about your lawn as a mini hay meadow, in effect. So you kind of leave it long through most of the year, or at least most of the summer, um, and then you normally would cut it once the wildflowers have finished flowering and have set seed. Um, and I've just kind of there highlighted a couple of the benefits of, of sort of managing a lawn like that. Um, generally, if you manage a lawn like that, you get um, a, a longer flowering season because you have flowers that flower early and then you have flowers that flower, you know, all the way through basically different flowers flower at different points um, through the summer. Um, and there are certain flowers, if you constantly keep cutting your lawn, obviously will never grow or they, well, they will grow, they'll be there, but they'll be so short and they will never go to flower. So things like oxide daisies and knapweeds, obviously are quite long and tall flowers. Um, and they need, the grass needs to be left completely for those to ever, ever get to a point where they might flower. So, so leaving a lawn long through the season and then cutting it towards the end of the summer will benefit a range of different flowers. Um, and then generally what you would do is take that grass completely away um, and then you let it grow again and then you just kind of repeat that cycle. So that's really kind of trying to mimic how, how farmers might have managed a hay meadow in the past. Um, so that's one way of thinking about maybe managing an area of grass in your garden. And then the other um, way of thinking about how you might manage an area to, and to still benefit wildflowers is to cut much less often um 
So last year we ran this campaign called Every Flower Counts. So this was Plant Life running this campaign and the idea really was to get people to start looking at what was growing in their lawns and leave their lawns long through May. Um, this had never really been done before and I'll talk a little bit more about the campaign towards the end but I mean the upshot of, of people sort of joining in this campaign made us start thinking about okay what if people start to not cut their lawns quite as frequently. I think it's common practice that people might cut their lawns every week every couple of weeks through the summer months. Um, so so we, we kind of looked at, okay, well, can we cut them much less often and can we still generate a benefit for wildflowers and for all the associated, um, you know, wildlife that's associated with wildflowers? And of course, I think the upshot of all this was really that if you leave a lawn um, and cut it less frequently, there are still quite a lot of flowers which are very much used to being, um, grazed so they, they grow very short very low to the ground and of course if they're only cut every three or four weeks they will still get an opportunity to keep flowering um, and so I mean the result really was that as you can see on the screen there um, we can support a huge number of wildflowers if you just cut your lawn less frequently so I suppose this is a way of thinking about you know managing a lawn and of course quite a lot of people are concerned about letting their grass grow really long because it can look messy and untidy and but this is a sort of I suppose another opportunity and another way of managing a lawn is to cut less frequently but it still can be a lawn um, and if you've got some of these lower growing flowers like the white clover and the uh, bird's foot trefoil and, and south here and these are very often very very common wildflowers in lawns and um, you can still get a huge amount of value from that lawn for a while for um, yeah, so that, you know, that's the kind of um, thing you might end up with. Something that still looks very attractive, but you can still kind of manage it as a lawn um, and still get a lot of the benefits that you might get from leaving the grass long. But just, just, it's just a bit different, I guess. It's a different approach to, to managing a lawn. Uh, can, I, can I jump in? There's a, there yep. are a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. And one was, um, sure. around, okay, what if you've got a lawn that's full of moss? Full of and moss. You want, yeah, it's got a lot of moss in and you want to yeah encourage yeah. more flowers to grow mm, mm. Do you yeah think, okay you remove any turf for that we're going to talk a little bit about what you might do in terms of trying to get an area more more flower rich so i will come on to that in a minute but i mean ultimately if you've got a lot of I'll, I think I'll cover that later on when we talk about that because it's, it's a good question. So just hang on, hang for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so so yeah. In terms of you know cutting a lawn, so you've got those options really. So you you know you can um, just think about how you know. I suppose one way to do it is to, is to try and go and look at your lawn and get a sense as to what's in your lawn, and that really means getting right down on your hands and knees ultimately, and actually having a really good poke around and seeing if there are many broadleaf plants in your lawn you know people some people call them weeds we would call them wildflowers obviously um but ultimately if you've got some of those in there the likelihood is if you just start to leave that lawn and let it grow long you're going to start get some you're going to get some flowering and ultimately you're going to you know you're going to generate some benefit from doing that so um so so that's one option is to look at your lawn decide what what you you know if there are yeah um the other option is you know thinking about enhancing um, an existing lawn and that is you know maybe it's got a lot of moss in or it's got very little or you can see very little um, apart from grass in there so there's different approaches to kind of um, trying to encourage more wildflowers into a lawn um, so well, I can just sort of briefly talk, talk those through I guess now And I guess these are sort of the main things that you would need to think about, really. Um, so if your lawn, so if you look at your lawn and you think, well, actually, there is very little in there. I can't see much. It's mostly just full of moss. It's mostly just grass and I can't see any other plants in there apart from grass. I suppose that's when you would think about, OK, what can I try and do to try and enhance it? Because if it is, you know, if it is a, a combination of grass and other bits and pieces, you know, probably the best thing to do is just to kind of leave it, either leave it, let it grow right the way through the season and then cut it at the end, like we just said, or you could start to do that much less frequent mowing. So mowing every three or four weeks and then observe and see what plants you might get. Um, but it, you know, if, if those options don't seem like they would be appropriate for your lawn and your lawn is just basically grass and very little else, then there's, there's, um, you know, that, that's when you might want to start to think about what else could I try and do to try and enhance it. 
Um, so obviously it's thinking about, you know, where might be most appropriate in your garden. Um, and sunlight is probably one of the key things. So ideally choosing somewhere that's got lots of sunlight and isn't too shaded. Um, most of the wildflowers that grow sort of in, you know, in the wider countryside in wildflower meadows tend to do best in full sun. Um, so ideally a, a sunny place is going to be better. Um, and this is also when you need to think about the type of soil you've got as well. Um, so we talked about this a, a little while ago in terms of, you know, some of you are probably on a, on a more lime rich chalky soil. Some people may be on a, 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 a more neutral clay soil as well. So the soil obviously has quite a bearing on the kinds of species that you might want to try and encourage or plant or seed into a lawn as well. Um, and obviously then the management, which we've also sort of touched on. Um, and then thinking about where you might get seed from. So we'll just kind of cover that a bit. So that's an example of, of OK, this was a lawn that had quite a lot of broad leafed plants in it and it was just left to grow through the season. Um, and of course, not if you don't necessarily know what you're looking at, and of course, until those things flower, some you know it's much easier to recognize plants when they're flowering. Um, and I think a lot of people might have just dismissed that lawn and thought, well, there's nothing particularly of interest in there. But of course, we've got we've got probably about a dozen different um, wildflower species in that lawn. Um, and that's just purely from leaving a lawn that has got quite a lot of broad leaves in it. So um, if your lawn's got very little in it, um, there are various ways of enhancing it to try and bring other wildflowers in it. And I think the, the, this mention about turf um, and uh, moss as well. Um, so this is a, um, a scarifier. And you can hire these from sort of um, plant, you know, the, the, the um, building merchants um, quite easily for about sort of 25, 30 pounds for a weekend. Um, I mean, people often use them to remove the moss out of their lawns, um, but they're ideal for removing moss, but they're also ideal for creating bare gaps in an existing lawn if you want to try and introduce wildflowers. Um, so this is quite um, a good method for trying to get more um, seeds into a lawn. So you, you start off by cutting the lawn very short um, and then you run this machine over it and of course what that does is it kind of scrapes the moss out and any other sort of thatch because often grass and lawns get quite a lot of thatch. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create some bare ground that we can then introduce some seed into. Um, I think people have probably, a lot of people often will get a packet of wildflower seeds, they might buy them from the garden centre, they might buy them online, um, and then they just scatter them on their lawn, hoping that that is going to be enough and they're going to grow. Um, and generally what happens is, um, a year later they've had no success at all, um, the, the seeds have done nothing. And it's ultimately because they haven't really created, they haven't created the right conditions in that lawn for the seeds to germinate. Um, so so to, for seeds to germinate they need little competition from the grass and they also need some bare ground so the seed needs to make contact with bare ground. So this machine is really really good for doing that. So this um, lawn here was scarified in October so to create that bare ground um, and then the seeds were then spread over the lawn. So I've got a few just images just to show you just to give you a sort of visual idea about what how that process works and what it looks like. But you would probably only do this in a lawn um, that didn't have anything in it already. You know, you know, most people's lawns probably have already got some wildflower species in it and we would probably encourage them just to leave those and see what's in there and manage them, you know, either by that every, every four week cutting or, or leave it to grow long and then just cut it annually. So this is really for those lawns that have got nothing in them at all. Um, and you're starting almost with a blank canvas. Um, so the other thing I sort of said about is the, is the soil type as well. So soil type is obviously very important um, for the kinds of plants you might grow. Um, and probably the best way to find that out is to actually do a pH test. I mean, I think you can pick these up fairly cheaply from garden centres and you can certainly buy them online for sort of, I don't know, probably less than £10. And that will give you an indication. And quite a lot of people in their gardens obviously are quite interested in this anyway, if they're trying to grow plants in the garden. So doing a pH test will tell you, I mean, you may know, 
a lot of people, you know, if, if, if they're keen on gardening, probably know whether their soil is heavy or whether it's clay or whether it's limestone and whether it's got flint or it's, you know, it's often quite obvious. Um, but if you're not sure, um, it's quite a good, it's a very good way to know the pH of your soil. Um, so, so yeah, so a more lime rich soil will have a higher pH um, and then a more neutral soil will have a pH of around seven. So anything above seven is basically starting to become more lime rich. Um, and so I've just put there a list of the types of flowers that you might want to try and introduce into a meadow that was either sort of sitting in the middle there, which is the neutral, which is around seven, or a more lime rich soil on the sort of more chalky soils there as well. So, um, and there's quite a lot of places you can purchase um, seeds from. We would always try and encourage people to look for a reputable seed supplier um, and ideally try and use native species as much as possible. Um, there are quite a lot of suppliers online and when you start to look at some of their mixes they're not necessarily always native wildflowers. Um, lots of people end up with poppies and cornflowers um, in their meadow mixes which look totally amazing and I'm sure lots of people have seen these kind of drifts of poppies in, in, a, in a meadow um, and of course what happens is they will survive in your meadow for the first year or so um, and as that as the grass starts to grow in that meadow, which it in, invariably will do in your lawn, um, it starts to smother out those plants. And also most of those things like poppies, cornflowers, are associated with arable fields. So they're actually annuals. And so they actually need cultivation every single year for them to, to germinate and to reflower. And of course, in a garden context and in a lawn context, that's not really possible and it's not going to happen um, so so you may have them for the first year and of course they will disappear after the first or second year normally and you'll be left with the perennial wildflowers so most of the ones on the list here are perennial wildflowers um, so plant life cells arrange different wildflowers based on different soil types there and sort of specifically really aimed at, at, at gardens really so we have it there's a mix there for, for more lime rich soils and then the other two mixes are more for sort of neutral soils so they would be ideal for, for those sort of different types of soil and they will have a range of wildflowers that are best suited to those types of soils and some of those that are listed there on the screen will, will be in those mixes and um, there are various other suppliers around as well um, I suspect probably the best thing for us to do is to send round a list of, of suppliers following this um, but you can see that you can get hold of a packet of seeds and relatively cheaply actually if you're trying to think about doing something in the garden so it's not a few on me um, a couple of suppliers that you might think about looking for on, online is a company called john chambers um, they they deal in native seed specifically uh, very reputable um, good supplier another one is called emma's gate uh, based up in um, norfolk again a very reputable supplier um, I think another one, Habitat Aid, I think may, may well be, um, they, they again supply native seed too as well. Um, so we would always encourage people to try and plant native seed as much as possible. Um, so once you've chosen your seed and you've done this scarifying and you've actually created some bare ground, so you can see there just in the photo how much bare ground has been created. And, and part of the reason for doing that scarifying in a lawn, and this, this, this is exactly the same principle that would be applied in, a, in the wider countryside if they were going to restore you know, a very big meadow, um, is about trying to suppress the grass. So that, that scarifying and, and sort of scratching up the surface of the soil is, a, is as much about suppressing the grass as it is about creating some bare ground for that seed to then make contact with the soil. Um, so, the, the, the seed has just been mixed with some sand which just helps it to be spread a bit more evenly across the grass um, so that you can you can spread it more more um, evenly so and they're literally just walking up and down and just spreading it out so it's pretty straightforward so i've just got a series of images really just kind of showing the sequence of, of, of before and after and, and during really so this was the lawn before um, anything was done there were a few um, wildflowers in this lawn um, but I think it was mostly um, grass um, I think there were a few dandelions but that was pretty much it so that was after it had been scarified um, unfortunately the scarifying machine doesn't actually collect any of the moss and any of the dead grass so you have to go and manually rake it all afterwards which is quite a lot of work as you can imagine but you end up with you can see how, how different the two looks so you've got you know you've got a lot of bare ground there because that's what's really important that that seed needs to make contact with that bare ground otherwise it will not germinate um, 
So that was the following February. So the good thing about that photo is you can still see some of that bare ground and you can see that the grass is not really too long and, and is, is the grass, but the scarifying that was done in the autumn was good because it actually suppressed the grass quite a lot and it meant the grass didn't grow back very lush and start filling in all those gaps again because the gaps are really important and the gaps are what is needed for those wildflowers to germinate and to grow really um, over the sort of autumn because a lot of those seeds that are planted so we planted so the seeding was done in October um, and then the the the, um, the lawn is left basically um, uncut I think there may have been one more cut to try and suppress the grass over the autumn because of course we tend to be getting milder and milder winters and what that means is that grass continues to grow right through the winter uh, which is which is not so good when you're trying to get wildflowers to germinate in a grassy area. Um, so it's all about trying to suppress that grass as long as you possibly can in the lawn. But you can still see in that photo, there's quite a lot of gaps there. So that's really good. So that, that this was the following February. Um, and this one I think was about two weeks ago, same area. So it's hard to see in the photo, unfortunately, you can't really see what's going on there, but what's, what's in the meadow that wasn't in there before, so there's, there's lots of sorrel in there, so again sorrel is a very common plant of wildflower meadows, and it's generally in a lot of these mixes. Um, there's quite a lot of um, common vetch growing in there, the taller plants in the back there that you can see, that sort of pea-like flowers, again, you know, quite common. Um, there's lots of buttercup, um, probably south heel as well in there. Uh, and I suspect there's some there's some birds foot trefoil as well in there as well. So, so ultimately, going through that process in a lawn that had very little wildflower in it last year has actually been very successful. But it's 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 the preparation, it's the creating of the bare ground, and then it's the, the subsequent sort of cutting in the autumn to keep the grass really short that has allowed those plants to then germinate. Um, and this lawn is actually going to be left long. So your two options, so the, the cutting every four weeks or the leaving it long and then cutting it once. So this lawn is going to be left long and it will probably be cut maybe, probably maybe late July, early August. So, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit now about an example of another um, meadow. And this, this is on a slightly larger scale. So this is a community uh, meadow. Um, I think this was mentioned by Katie earlier. So this is this is the village of Speen, um, which is somebody tell me roughly where that is in the Chilterns. Uh, sorry, I was. It's kind of um, when I picture the Chilterns area, it's kind of south east. Okay. Um, in the area that we work in, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. It's pretty much centre of the project area. To be oh, honest, yeah. uh, you kind of just. Just go a bit further south from Brisbane, and you're not a million miles out from it there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so again, I mean, I think the, the geology around there is quite mixed because there are areas of chalk very close by. But as it turns out, this meadow itself is not sitting on the chalk, or at least the soil itself is not is not particularly chalky. So, so it's it's kind of sitting in the middle. It's it's one of these more neutral meadows. Um, so I I was kind of or plant life were contacted by by um, the community group there. Um, in the village saying that they've been they've been managing this area of, of sort of community green space for quite a number of years um, and they've been cutting it and we, we talked a little bit about how they've been managing it and of course that you know as I said earlier the management is really really critical to, to trying to encourage more wildflowers and to main to maintain wildflower meadows it's all about the management really once you've done the seeding um, it's about the management um, so, so I went and visited this meadow in, I think, July of last year um, and talked, talked to the community group about it. Um, and this was really ultimately where the contact with Katie came about was through this group. Um, so the meadow, I think they've been managing it by cutting and removing every single year for probably 10 or 15 or, or more years. So, you know, really, really positive. I mean, it's really, really good that, you know, Ideally, that's what you want to be doing to your meadow is, is, is taking the cuttings away once the flowers have flowered and then set seed. Ultimately, that's generally what we would encourage people to do. And again, you know, that, that applies to a lawn as well as it does to these slightly bigger areas. Um, and, but of course, when you start to look into this meadow, you start to notice that actually there isn't as much going on. In some places, the meadow was actually quite species rich, did have quite a lot of wildflowers in it. 
in other places you notice that there were, the grass was much more dominant and again this 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 could easily be your lawn some some bits of your lawn might might be quite species rich there might be lots of broadleaf plants in there and very little grass and yet other bits might be much more just dominated by grass um, and as it turned out I suppose the majority of this meadow was more dominated by grass than it was dominated by wildflowers um, and you can sort of think about why that might be it's partly down to the nutrients possibly being higher so the grass just grows very rich because the nutrients are higher um, it's also likely to be down to the way that the, the site has been managed as well probably so at some point it may not have been managed as well as it's being managed now and they weren't necessarily always doing that cut and remove um, so to try and encourage wildflowers into this area we went through the same process that i've just described that you can do in a garden we did on on a larger scale um, so it was getting the grass very very short um, so in september they 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 did their usual cut and remove which is what they always do um, you know which is great because they you know they're, they're, they're trying to trying to remove the nutrients by by not just leaving the grass on because if you just leave the grass on if you just cut the grass and leave it ultimately those nutrients are just being recycled and you're not lowering the nutrients in the field and often that will favor less wildflowers and more grass because the grass will just suck up all the nutrients and will just grow very very strong um so they they did this cut they did the remove um in the meadow and then they got one of these machines they hired the machine in um, and they got because it was the community and um, they got they got a load of people from the village some of the kids came out and helped um, and they managed to to, to scarify and, and create some bare ground they didn't do the whole meadow because the whole meadow is probably a well over an acre in size so the idea was just to go into the areas where where the where it was more dominated by the coarser more vigorous grasses that we knew were the grasses that were stopping any of the wildflowers growing um, so they went in and they created this bare ground and then they sowed um, a plant called yellow rattle. Um, I suspect some of you have heard of yellow rattle. It's one of these plants and it's, it's a, what they call a semi-parasitic plant and it actually, it actually sort of taps its, um, it actually starts to take nutrients from the grass. So it's often used in meadow restorations to sort of kickstart meadow restoration and start to reduce or suppress grass. Um, so if you've got a very, very grassy area and the grass is the thing that dominates. So if you leave your lawn, for example, for a year and you don't cut it, like we've just talked about, and you find that it's just all, all grass and there's very little else in there, this might be an option to, to, to go through this process of, of creating the bare ground and then introducing yellow rattle as one way to try and help suppress the grass. So that's what they've done in the meadow. So ultimately, the yellow rattle over time will start to grow more it will start to expand out of the areas that it was sown into provided they can manage it in the right way um, and hopefully that will start to suppress the grass in this meadow and that will allow enough gaps and less grass and other wildflowers will naturally come into those gaps and if they don't there's still an opportunity at some point maybe in year three four or five to introduce some more wildflower seeds so this is the meadow i think literally last week um, you can still see some of that bare ground from where they did that scarifying in the autumn. Um, you can see quite a lot of buttercup there. You probably can't see it because it's not a particularly high resolution photograph, unfortunately. Um, but of course, what they have managed to get established is the yellow rattle, um, which is really good because that's the thing that we want to get established in this meadow because ultimately that's the thing that is going to suppress the grass and allow some of the wildflowers that are already in other parts of the meadow probably to spread across into the into the parts that are, are still very dominated by the coarser grasses so again you know you could easily apply that exact same principle to your garden if you've got an area that is just very much grassy and, and dominated by lots and lots of grass So that's one way of, of introducing plants is to go through that scarifying process and then spread the seed on the surface. The other way to do it, so if you've got a lawn that is just grass and, and you know, has, you know, I suppose was re-turfed maybe um, and has got nothing of any interest in it at all, um, the other option potentially, the more dramatic option is to strip the turf off um, and then sow into the bare ground. Um, and of course, one of the advantages of doing that is that you've got no competition at all from the grass, which is obviously really good um, because the wildflowers obviously have got less competition. So they're going to have more space 
um, than that scarifying method that I've just described. So that, you know, that's one, one benefit of doing it. Um, but of course you are potentially losing anything that might already be in those, in that turf, because, you know, the, 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 often there are other things in those turfs. So, you know, I would say that you, you probably only do this if you know there's absolutely nothing of any value in your lawn. And obviously it's, it's a lot more work as well, because you've got to sort of, you've got to dig it all up, you've got to strip it all away and you've got to put it somewhere. So, you know, it's, it's a fairly laborious job to do. Um, but, you, but, but the, you know, the, the same principles apply. Ultimately, you're creating some bare ground and then you're going to spread seed on that bare ground in the autumn. And then, you know, once you've got these things established, you, you then think about those two management options for, you know, for a lawn. So, you know, you could go and do the annual cut option where you leave it very long and let it grow right through the season and then cut it at the end of the summer. And then it's that cut and remove of any of the material. Or you think about, I mean, depending on what you've sown. So if you've sown things like South Hill and the clovers, um, which you could obviously, you know, you could pick out some of those lower growing plants and sow those specifically in a lawn. Um, you could then go into the management of cutting it every three or four weeks. So you've kind of got two options really in a garden context. Um, you, you've got the sort of more traditional, I'm managing it more like a hay meadow, the annual cut, or you've got this, you know, four weekly cut through the growing season. Matt, um, which just, will favour these much lower growing, shorter plants. Yeah. yeah. Matt, just on the on the cutting, a uh, question in from Jane. Yeah. Around yeah. if cutting late in July time, how short should you uh, should you cut? I would really well, close I mean, crop cut or leave it quite high. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's fairly close crop to be honest. Yeah, I mean, if you can cut it down, I mean, as short as your mower will go, really. Ultimately, um, but you probably could. I mean, the trick really. I mean it's very hard to give an exact date for cutting. I mean, you're better off to look at the flowers that are in your lawn and see whether they've finished flowering and see if any of those have actually set seed before you cut. Um, so, cause we all say, I'll just, I'll cut in July, but actually that, you know, obviously this year things are gonna be quite far ahead. I mean, the later you cut, the more those things will have definitely finished flowering and set seed. But obviously if you cut much, if you cut later, you tend to, fa you tend to favor more later flowering plants over time. So, so we would recommend cutting probably late July to August and cut as short as you can really. And then you, the, the most important thing is that you do remove the cuttings. You don't just leave the cuttings there. Um, and sometimes this can be quite tricky with a mower because if the grass has grown up quite long and is quite lush, you know, you, you, you may have to run over it several times and start with the mower very high, cut a bit and then cut a bit more and then cut a bit more and, and it can be quite time consuming. Or you can use something like a, you know, a, a, a strimmer or um, a brush cutter or something like that. So, but yeah, try and cut it as short as you possibly can and, and then remove and rake and, and clear all the cuttings away if you're going to go down that route. Thank you. And obviously the same applies for that, that if you're going down the, the route of the four weekly management as well, you still want to be removing those cuttings when you do that four weekly cut. Has anyone else got any other? Um, if it's a dry winter, do you have to water the seeds? Um, I mean, generally in the autumn, um, I mean, I suppose the reason we would say that you plant in the autumn is because generally it's wetter <laughs> normally um, and of course quite a lot of those seeds actually do require cold weather to germinate as well so they germinate in the autumn and obviously they get established they get their, get their roots down in the autumn and they will do better um, I've not I've never had to water or never seen or known anyone have to water if they've done in the autumn sowing generally because it's generally there's generally enough moisture in the ground I mean, last year was crazy, wasn't it? I mean, we had so much, we had so much moisture in the ground. <laughs> I suspect some seeds rotted away, but if you, I mean, you have got the option to do spring sowing of, of wildflowers, but generally that's not as reliable because the ground obviously can dry out very, very quickly. So we would always generally try and encourage people to do autumn sowing. I mean, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about watering to be honest, unless it was exceptionally dry. Um, so, but yeah. Um, we've also, Sarah's just asked, to, can we just clarify about the cutting at different times? Yes. Um, is that in order to, for us to get early or late flowering wildflowers and, and roughly when would that be? If it is about the timing of the flowering or is it um, a bit more rule of thumb, I guess? 
it depends which option you're looking at. So if you're looking at the four weekly sort of cutting, was that, was that the one that we're talking about? Um, I think it's a general question, really. Can, so if, okay. uh, Sarah just asked if we can clarify, to, can we cut at different times to get early or late flowering wildflowers? I mean, most of the, the sort of the, the guidance around cutting for wildflowers is based on the way that farmers traditionally managed hay meadows. So hay meadows are really where most of these wildflowers tended to to exist in traditional hay meadows and most of the work that we do in conservation these days is trying to restore those similar sorts of management practices whether it be in a garden or in a in a field or in a you know in a landscape context so historically farmers would have made hay normally in probably mid july to august um, and so before that the field would have been shut up and it wouldn't have had anything done to it at all so from probably late february nothing would have been done in that field so if you really you apply that same principle in your garden so if you don't do any cutting from late february through to probably at the earliest mid-july you could leave it later if you'd like because the later you leave it the more you will favor some of the later flowering plants but you don't cut anything at all and then you cut it all at the same time so that's really mimicking how a hay meadow would operate in the wider landscape or the countryside so that you know that that's the way that we would sort of encourage people to manage um, a meadow now there, there is there's a couple of exceptions to that so that's how you manage from say february through to the end of the summer now in a in a hay meadow normally they would have put some animals onto their hay meadow after they took the hay cut so after july they would have put they would have put sheep or cattle on their meadow and those cattle would have stayed on their meadow right the way through probably through till maybe late february depending on the season and how wet it was so they would have been eating a lot of that grass and keeping the grass very short through the autumn and through into the early winter and of course that's not always very easy to put a load of animals on your lawn i suspect um so it, so to try and mimic that later grazing and um, what we would call aftermath grazing was what what they were doing in meadows um we it may be necessary and in an ideal world you might want to do a cut in the autumn as well so if the grass grows very long through through the summer through the late summer after you've taken your hay cut um, you know it may be an option to go and do another late cut but you probably wouldn't do that cut any later than say the end of February yeah okay and so then you leave that you leave that area completely uncut right through to the following late July or August and then you just keep repeating that cycle yeah so really what we're saying is for the longer grass later flowering species you just leave it till late summer and that's when you'll get yeah. those yeah absolutely yeah so things like devil's bit scabious for example which is quite a, a you know a plant that you know potentially grow and you know again that grows in lawns it can grow in lawns and it could be in a lawn that someone's got and it may be suppressed maybe still growing in there but it's just being cut and cut by by constant mowing so if you if you left that area right through till september you may see devil's bit scabious flowering yeah. so which is yeah, and then the other side so, of that is if you want if you would prefer to cut some of your lawn sometimes if you can reduce the cutting to once a month yeah and you're exactly so yeah 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 absolutely yeah 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 so you've got you've got the two options really you've got the you can go down the traditional i'm going to manage my lawn as a little mini hay meadow as we just described or you've got the option to think well actually i can see that i've got some clover in, in my lawn because clover is quite an easy one to spot I mean, self heal again is a fairly easy one to spot, and quite a lot of the trefoils are quite easy ones to spot as well. And those are all short growing wildflowers, which are very much associated with grazing. So they all they all grow very very short to the ground, and they can cope with being cut or, or grazed in effect. You know, so that they've adapted the way they grow to be nibbled or cut. <laughs> Um, and of course that means they will just keep repeat flowering so even if they are cut and then that is left for maybe three or four weeks they will flower again and they will flower again and again and again and same with daisies why do we always get so many daisies on our lawn even after we've cut it you know literally within about three or four days the, you know the daisies are just covering the lawn again so so there are a lot of these wildflowers which are very much adapted to to regular cutting or grazing that links quite nicely to a question from claire actually that she's she's just asked if there are any flowers or weeds that you'd recommend removing because they're dominant for example dandelions or plantain 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't worry about dandelions. I mean, I think dandelions are great and they, you know, they, they support a whole load of in, in, insects. You know, you, if you if you go and just sit and look at a dandelion, it'll, it'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be alive with insects at that time. And of course, it's quite an early flower as well. So, you know, so if you think about that, there are sequences and, and, and obviously, you know, we, I mean, we know this, don't we, in, you know, in, in nature, I mean, the plants all kind of come at different, there's a sequence of flowering for different plants at different times of the year. So, so the dandelions are early. I mean, there are, I've got, I think there's hardly any dandelions left in my lawn now, but earlier on it was absolutely covered in dandelions. So, yeah. you know, what I'm seeing now is cats here. So, you know, um, and, and some of the trefoils are starting to come and, and the red clover, but of course that wasn't there when the dandelions were growing really well. So you're, you know, the longer you can leave it, the more, pollen and nectar you're generating at different times of the year and i suppose that's that's the key to it isn't it you know so if you do if you are able to leave your you know not cut your lawn early you're generating you know you're generating some value for some of those flying insects at that time of year when there is very little else for them yeah. i think as well in so. answer to Claire's question because i think I, I have my back garden is full of dandelions and lots and lots of plantain um, and yep. I love that to flower last year. I actually really like it when it flowers. It's beautiful. But mm, my lawn mm. is like that because it's very nutrient rich. It's one of these lawns that um, Matt referred yep. to. It's really been turf that's been laid. So really, if I wanted that to have wildflowers in it, then I would have to go down the route of scarifying that, which would help to break up some of those more dominant species such as plantain. And then reseeding it or even removing the turf now i'm not going to do that yeah, yeah. I to just have long grass but um but i think you need to find a balance that you're kind of happy with as well if you want wildflowers then you might have to go down the route of removing turf or scarifying and, and sort of the more labor intensive work i'm quite a lazy gardener so i'm probably not going to be doing that it's a, it's a bit of a question. yeah and i think that's absolutely right and in, and in some situations it may be very challenging to get more wildflowers because you may have very nutrient rich soil and, and this is often the case with some people you know and of course if you really are serious about this you know and you and you're you know if you can see that your lawn is very lush for example and and it is dominated by things like you know dandelions and the grass always seems to be very lush and and grows very quickly the likelihood is the soil is probably quite nutrient rich which will mean it's it's probably always going to be quite challenging to get many wildflowers to establish wildflowers you know the most species rich meadows churchyards gardens are always on poor low nutrient soil as a rule um you know and like we said i mean that you know you can you can but there are you doesn't mean you won't get any wildflowers in a nutrient rich meadow in a nutrient rich place or a nutrient rich garden you just won't necessarily get huge huge variety because there are some new wildflowers that are more robust and if you think about some of the wildflowers that grow on, on our verges that are very much used to little management or management that's kind of very sporadic you know things like the um my brain is completely emptied temporarily can someone chip in um i don't know what you're thinking of i mean we get a lot of cow parsley we get a lot of yep exactly okay I'm, th I'm thinking of the um, yarrow. That's a very yeah. robust plant which survives on, on, on verges. I mean, even, even some of the, um, uh, oh, gee, <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? My mind's full of too many other things. But what I'm saying is there are a range of wildflowers that are stronger and more robust and will survive in more mute um, places. And, and again, we, you know, this is something if people feel that that is their lawn, we, we've got lists of those kinds of plants so we can sort of help you think about what might be more suited to those sort of sites. Um, but I think the thing is, your soil will always dictate what will grow there. And I think you've kind of got to work with what you've got. And I think, you know, as gardeners, we often think, well, we can just, I, mean, I suppose as the human race, we think we can control and change everything, don't we? But I think it's much more interesting, actually, just to kind of let things, you know, it's like, well, OK, this is what I've got. What can I what what will grow here? That is the interesting thing, just to kind of let it grow and see what will come up. You know, I, you know, I didn't realise half of what was in my lawn until I left it this year. You know, I, you know, I could see there was a bit of clover in there, but, you know, beyond that, I wasn't sure. Way, isn't it? Is, is actually letting it grow is the point is maybe your yeah. starting point for a lot of people thinking about this just to see what's going to come up first and be a little bit patient and it might be next year that you do something differently once you've worked yeah and i wouldn't i definitely wouldn't rush to do the seeding unless you've been trying to manage an area of your lawn for wildflowers for the last five years and you've got nothing of particular interest in there 
um, but then that maybe you want to think about what we've just discussed the scarifying or the, or the you know the reseeding options they might might be an option but I think for most people if they haven't ever left an area of their lawn I would just leave it and see what comes up this seems like a good opportunity for maybe just to have a, a couple of minutes break if um, if people want to just go and stretch their legs or whatever I feel like I've just talked to everybody um, how do long people feel? Time. Um, I'm not sure how much longer Matt's got because we'd like to just talk about every flower counts, which is measuring. Yeah, that's really what I was going to talk about now. So. Um, I don't think it's so long uh, part of the presentation. Um, I'm not sure. No, how it's long. not. Um, no, it's we'll probably only another 10 minutes or so. If you need, like, say, five minutes just to take a break and then come back in um, to us just to, if people need to get cups of tea or take a comfort break, that might be, this might be a good point just to do that. Okay, so we'll see you back here in five minutes, 20 past. I think we're well over time, aren't we? I've probably ran. We are, yeah. Maybe so, um, we'll make that set last section quite quick if we can. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Sorry about that. Matt, can you hear me? Yep. Hey there, sorry, my neighbours just decided to get the drill out and started drilling all the way through, so I don't really want to be off mute for too long. But um, oh. one thing we have to come back to is the conversation around moss, um, friend of moss. Uh, ecological value or otherwise. So maybe if we can pick up about moss. Um, yeah. At some, when everyone's back in a few minutes, um, it was kind of one of those ones we we're going to come back to, wasn't it? But... Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to moss. That's all right, thank you. That's all right. Matt, uh, just a quick question. We're going to we're recording this, obviously, and we'll make this available for everyone. But um, are we able to get the slides as well? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can I can put the slides into a PDF or something if you want to Super, share yeah. them around. Yeah, yeah. And there's a few links in those slides as well. So yeah. for people, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I've only literally got like a handful more slides. So fine, yeah. I shouldn't have put so many slides in. I should have. It's always <laughs> that like tendency to like, oh, I just stick that. Out. Yeah, yeah. But, um, there's always quite a lot to say about it, isn't there? So that's good. It's got a couple of minutes, and then we can start again. I think I said twenty past, didn't I? We've still got everyone with us, haven't we? We've still got about I 30 people so, yeah, haven't just I'm drifted just, away. So <laughs> I guess I'm that's all right. I can't hear it when we don't want to start. Working. So I just thought it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because you're, you're so used to having people like getting a little bit of feedback from people when you do yeah. these things. But when you're literally doing it and there's just complete silence. Oh, well, we can't see. It's very people. weird. We can't no, you see can't people. see any sort of reaction. You can't really see if it's going, you know, I, I used to be a teacher and of course standing in front of a club, you know, and just, yeah. 
you know, and you get you get a bit of interaction with people, but when you're just literally just talk, it feels like I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> it's just very odd. I think we've been doing a lot of that the last few weeks, haven't we? Just yeah, I know. It's yeah, yeah. It's um. Okay. Do you do you want to kick off again? It's just it's just about twenty. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Sure Hopefully people. everyone everyone yeah. can hear me still. So I just really wanted to kind of wrap this up really by talking about this every flower count. So this is a campaign that Plant Life started last year, and it's really about the idea is a, a citizen science project. So we're trying to really make it like the Great British Garden Bird Watch. Ultimately, I think the idea is this will continue to run. Um, so, so it's preceded by no mow May. So hopefully everyone has left their lawn through May and let it let the grass grow long, which is what we've obviously been talking about. Um, this weekend, we're encouraging people to go out into their lawn, basically, and count the wildflowers in their lawns. And then we've got we've got a way of, of kind of collecting that information. So I'll just briefly talk about that through. So, so what we're really asking you to do is go onto the website. So if you go onto the link there, if you if you just put if you just basically Google no um, sorry every flower counts, it'll take you to this page. You can register um, on the plant life website for it um, and then we will send you various bits of information so we'll send you out some identification sheets um, or we'll, we'll send you a link to them and you can download them and then we'll also send you a recording form basically so what we're asking people to do is to identify a certain number so we're not saying i try and identify every single wildflower in your lawn um, I think we're looking at basically about 13 species that we're asking and 13 of the more common species that are fairly typical of, of lawns that are, are cut fairly frequently. So some of these low growing plants like daisies, um, birds foot trefoil there and there's common mouse here and some of these other ones that are fairly typical and they you know, often will be in lawns that haven't been you know, relayed as turf. So the likelihood is if you've left your lawn through May, you're probably going to have some of these species. And then we're asking people to count the numbers of flowers. Um, in a quadrat so it's not it's not just count them it's, it's count them so the idea is you basically just randomly choose a spot in your lawn and what we're asking them to do is basically just throw a ball into their lawn and wherever that ball lands you basically just somehow visualize a meter square you could do it with some canes or you could do it with some string or something like that and then you just go and you take these these id sheets out with you and you basically just go and record the numbers of flowers um, and then you basically take that information you stick it into the um the plant life website and it will then generate what we're calling a nectar score so it will basically you also have to measure your lawn as well i forgot to say that so you have to measure your lawn and of course you can do more than one quadrat if you like you know the more you do the more accurate this will be but if you know you can just do one that's fine um so you input that information in uh, along with the size of your lawn and then the computer will go away and it will calculate your nectar score based on the plants that are in flower um, and say if you leave your lawn through the whole summer it will generate this much nectar for bees ultimately is, is what the calculation has been done on but obviously we know that lots and lots of other insects use lawns and use wildflowers not just bees but the, the statistical part of it is based on bees because that's that's something that they've they've kind of calculated so um, so yeah so that that's obviously what we'd like you to hopefully go away and do this weekend so I'd encourage you to log on this evening um, and register yourself on the Every Flower Counts website and, and get this information and go and go and count the, um, the flowers in your in a, in a very small part of your lawn um, over the weekend or even if, if you haven't got a lawn you could still I mean if you've got some green space nearby if you've got if you're if you're able to go out for a picnic i think we can probably go out for a picnic now can't we uh, you know and you've got a playing field that perhaps hasn't been cut you could easily go and do it in, in a playing field or, an, or another piece of green space somewhere it was just a couple of other things we sort of just wanted to just, just sort of talk a little bit more about you know wildflower friendly gardening obviously there's lots you can do in your garden for wildflowers you know apart from leaving your lawn um, and there are lots of useful resources online as well for, for, for sort of finding more about, you know, how you can do beneficial things in your garden. Um, Plant Life has got a really useful um, sort of page really around sort of all sorts of things you can do. And so there's some more details there about how you can establish wildflower meadows and, and in your garden. Um, but it's also got this, this clever little tool on there where you can basically put in the kinds of flowers you might be interested in and when you'd like them to flower and what the context of where you might be putting them in your lawn and it will generate you a list of wildflowers that might be suited to that situation. So this is quite a fun little tool where you can just literally log on so you can sort of filter down on the left hand side there you can say I want flowers in the spring you know I want to do a meadow I want I, I've got a more of a shady area or I've got I want to put some in my wild flat in my border so you, and it will generate lists of plants and, and suggest um, how you might go about growing them so so that's quite a fun thing to try 
some reason my slides got muddled up. So there we go, there's, <laughs> there is your every flower count. So that's the idea of using some canes. Um, I'm just gonna show you this quick slide at the end here as well. So this, this is basically illustrating how flowers change over the season. So you can see that there's very little obviously flowering in the early, early spring and then these, these flowers are all sort of flowering at different times of the year. So I suppose what this is really illustrating is that you have a succession of flowers in meadows or in, or in a lawn, all flowering at slightly different times. And of course that is then allowed, you know, that is generating nectar and pollen throughout the season really. So the more you can leave your lawn long and not cut it so frequently, the more beneficial it's going to be. And then we've got this little groovy little animation, which really just explains in very simple terms our Every Flower Counts campaign. That's the promo. So I've just got on the end here, and there's probably not really much point showing it, but we'll share the slides with you. So some links to some sort of further online reading. So there's, there's quite a lot of information out there about all sorts of garden related wildlife stuff. So we just pulled together a few useful links there for people. Um, and I think Katie, you, you did that podcast as well, didn't you, about no yeah, Well, not... Be Bout at the moment, we, we've got a series of podcasts related to wildlife garden coming out. I did one, uh, well it recorded it two weeks ago Kate who's here um, she recorded one around ponds which will pro that might, it's probably gone out today actually so uh, if anyone's on Facebook if you go to the Facebook page that's where they're releasing those um, but obviously the Bebout website anyway we have um, various different bits of information about wildlife gardening so so there is there are more resources around wildlife gardening there um, with regard to the Every Flower Counts campaign, I, I, um, Natalie just asked if uh, you're restricted to only recording the species that are on the records, or if there's room to add in anything else that's not on there as well. Um, I, I haven't signed up, so I can't look at the survey forms, but I suspect there is space on the forms to record other Yeah, no, I think there is space. I think you can add more, and to be honest, yeah. But ultimately, I think that the, the, stat, the stats side of things, which calculates your nectar score, is yeah. based on the plants that are in the list. But yeah, I'm pretty sure you can add more yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and obviously, if you have got other things, you you know, you can still record those. And you know, there's other means, for, you know, for recording other interesting things in your garden, aren't there? In terms of where you might want to put those records. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you 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 guys can explain more about that. I record, or I don't know quite. Yeah, know how you, some of the surveys um, we've done, like the the. Um, poms, the fit counts that we've been doing, you, you, you only look at one species on their flower, but there's no reason why you can't do it for another flower that's mm. not in their list and still submit the record. It's just that it will, the way it's used by them for their data will be, will, will be done differently. So yeah. I think yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and absolutely. also, um, from what I was reading with the nectar scores as well, obviously the, the promo talks about bees um yeah. honeybees and and just the reason for that is really because there's really good uh, research on there's good scientific data around how much they need and and so it's easy to calculate but obviously you know we're obviously very much aware that it's not just about bees and we're not just trying to promote bees <laughs> yeah. 
you know, the loss of wildflowers are good for all sorts of other pollinators. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be good for bees. It's likely to be good for other pollinators as well. So, and I suppose really the point to make is the more variety of, of wildflowers you have, the, the more beneficial it's going to be. And the longer those are able to flower through the season, um, the better, really. Great. That's great. I so, think, um, I don't think we've got any other questions that have come up. So I think we might kind of leave it there. Um, yeah. Already there's a few people really keen and excited to do the to do the survey. It's a really nice way into doing a bit of surveying as well if you're not kind of used to that. Um, so um, it's also a nice yeah, and the ID sheets are nice and clear and very simple and they've got you know they've got a little bit of description, they've got some really good photos on them. So in terms of trying to identify some of those wildflowers in a garden or on a lawn, it you know, hopefully makes it as straightforward as possible. Exactly. Um, so I think with that, that's us done. Nick, did you want to add anything else or? Just to start off, if the draw goes in the background, I'll apologise again, but just to say thank you, Matt, thank you, Katie, for taking the time this afternoon. And, and also to make the links back to the pollinator monitoring scheme. So the fit counts that, um, that Martin Harvey spoke about seems forever ago now, back in, in March time, the two, the two work really well together. So if you're going to do your, your your every flower count survey, have a look at some some of the pollinator stuff as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. It really yeah. starts to build a picture of the richness of your gardens and the value of your gardens, really. So, so thank you, Matt. You've got a time to prepare for that. Much appreciated. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. And it'd be great to hear if you if you do get out there this evening, the, this weekend, and throw your ball in the garden. It'd be great to get some pictures. Yeah, and I was going to say if you really, if you um, see some results. Just one thing yeah. before we go, I was just thinking. I mean, if people are on social media, and I don't know how many people are, but if they are, we will, you know, obviously we we have a social media presence, and obviously we'd love to see people, you know, photograph of somebody doing surveys out in their garden or or anything they might have seen, or you know, um, I think we've got a hashtag no mo may or something like that there was probably an every flower counts hash i should know this shouldn't i i should really be plugging this i can't believe i'm not saying this correctly <laughs> being being told off but yeah but you know if you want to share your your pictures of, of doing your survey I we'd, we would love to see them and we will um we will certainly appreciate that so yeah. in which case thank you everybody um enjoy your weekends and um, i'll be back in touch with further sessions but have a great bank holiday and we'll speak soon Stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks very much. That was brilliant.